we had a community request to the book form, just want to bring it to your attention. I don't think it needs to be made part of the record. <coughs> uh, both parties agreed that it doesn't need to be made part of the record. Yes, sir. Uh, next, you received a copy of the uh, final charge pack, uh, and um, I just wanted to say that uh, the indictment conjunctive allegation is that charge number 26, the dates of indictment is at charge number 31, aggregate battery and definition of use list is at charge number 43, and uh, of course the venue is still learned as before. That additional language, just rather than having try to, to call through this packet quickly, uh, let me just direct your attention to exactly where those changes are. Thank you. Okay, anything else? We discovered that there were some errors made in um, on my part um, in the um, tendering of evidence. Um, we tendered in all of the following pictures. But um, the numbering was wrong. So a uh, court report and I have uh, come to a, an agreement, the state has an agreement with, with us, and so I just wanted to put on the record. Um, number 177, we are not using number 177, and instead we have um, that last tender of evidence should read that uh, defendants exhibit 210, 195, 183. 176, 187, 175, 193, 174, 171, 180, 196, and 180 should be included in the last package of photographs tender. Can you just by the state? Okay. We have remarked the exhibits accordingly. All right, thank you. Thank you. Are we ready for the jury? Yeah, sir. Okay, let's bring the jury. Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for the long delay. Appreciate you being back here promptly at one o'clock. We've reached that point in the trial where the attorneys are given an opportunity to make their summations or closing arguments to you. Uh, the state has the burden of proof, therefore, they have the right to open and conclude. What says the state? We will open that. All right. And will you open? I will do the opening. I'll move the first part of it. All right. Mr. Chase. Good afternoon. It's been together for quite a while now, huh? It's coming to an end. I promise you after the next couple hours, the lawyers are finally going to close their mouths and go and do what they do with you. But we have a few more things that we just want to say to you before we get to that point. You all are still, that you've been here hearing this case in the state of Georgia versus Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum. We're going to review some of the evidence that you've heard over the past two and a half weeks. Ms. Young told you when we first began this, that they put up a facade. What they projected to those around them, what they projected to DFACS, what they projected to Layla and Millie's family, what they projected to everyone was a facade. And ladies and gentlemen, you saw that facade continue in this courtroom. That's what we have witnessed over the past two and a half weeks. But as the evidence has shown, and as we are going to review this afternoon, the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt that they are responsible for the death and abuse of Layla Dane. And they are responsible for the abuse of Millie Place. You've heard a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with Millie Place and Layla Dane. You've heard things about Peggy Banks. She must be a racist. You've heard about Cynthia Tate. She might be an alcoholic. You've heard a lot of stuff to try to distract you from the truth of what happened. So let me remind you, this is why we are here today. We are here today because of Layla Daniel, a little girl who died far too young. And we are here because of Millie Place, a young girl whose life has been forever changed 
by the four months that they, she spent with these two people. Before we get too much more to that, my job here, I hope I can be, at least keep you somewhat entertained while we go over the law, because the law may not be the most exciting part, right? But it is really, really important. It's important that you understand when you go back into the jury room and you start analyzing the evidence and you start looking at the law that the judge is going to give you, what your job is. So what is your job? Every juror has a duty to follow the law and fairly and accurately seek the truth. Despite what the defense is going to want you to think, your job is not to seek doubt. Your job is to seek the truth of what happened to Millie Daniel. And, excuse me, Layla Daniel and Millie Place. You are bound by the law and the instructions that the judge gives to you. Every juror has a duty to deliberate. If someone actually back there refuses to deliberate, you can bring that to our attention. What are some of the things that you should, should consider when you are back in that jury room? Well, kind of put it on the screen for you. The things on the outside are things that you shouldn't be considering. You shouldn't judge this case based upon passion, based upon any public opinion, whether or not you are unhappy with the police. If you are unhappy with the police, contact their chief. If I've done something or one of my coworkers has done something that's offended you, we work for Sherry Boston, the elected district attorney of DeKalb County, and I can guarantee you that she will take it up with us. But please, please don't take that out on Millie and Layla. Any public feelings, you shouldn't decide this based upon sympathy for the defendant, whether you have any prejudices, whether you disagree with the law, and you're not to concern yourself with the penalty or punishment. So your job here is to determine whether or not the state has presented enough evidence to prove all of the charges brought in that indictment. So what are the things you should rely on? You should rely on the statements and the various statements that you've heard. Have you heard perhaps some conflicting statements come from the defendant? That are the things that you can consider. You can consider expert testimony. What expert testimony did you hear and what expert testimony do you believe? You're allowed to use your common sense. We did not ask you to leave your common sense at the door <coughs> when you came in three weeks ago. You're allowed to use your common sense when you judge the credibility of the witnesses, when you judge whether or not someone is telling you the truth. Testimony of the victim, testimony of witnesses that come in here, photos and documents, you got a lot. Elements of the crime, and who has a motivation to lie? Who in this case has a motivation to lie? The defendant. These are all things that you should consider and are allowed to consider. So let's talk about some of those legal principles that you've probably watched or seen when you watch Law and & Order and CSI and all those crime shows. First one, the burden of proof rests upon the state to prove each and every material element beyond a reasonable doubt. And I stand here on behalf of my coworkers, and we proudly do that. We proudly stand here to prove what happened to those little girls. The presumption of innocence. The judge is going to tell you that the, there's a legal presumption that the defendants start this trial um, it, uh, legally innocent. But that does not mean they are actually innocent. Because with each and every piece of evidence that we brought you, we've shown what truly happened in that home. What truly happened to those little girls. Just because there's a presumption of innocence does not mean the defendants are actually innocent. Reasonable doubt. That's the bread and butter. I can tell you that, I'll tell you a little secret. Don't tell anyone, including the media. Don't tell anyone. I used to be a defense attorney. When I first started off, I was actually a defense attorney. And the bread and butter of defense is reasonable doubt. Trying to create reasonable doubt. Trying to confuse all of you. So let's talk about what reasonable doubt really is. What the judge is going to tell you, it has to be reasonable. It's exactly what it says. It is based upon common sense and reason. See, once again, it's that common sense part. We don't want you to leave that at the door. It's not a vague or arbitrary doubt. Hmm, I don't really know. It's a doubt for which a reason can be given. So if you're in the back, you're like, I don't really know. I don't know. That's not a doubt for which a reason can be given. We are not required to prove beyond a mathematical certainty or to beyond all doubt, because that's impossible. So what does it mean? It's the doubt of a fair-minded, which all of you are, impartial juror, honestly seeking the truth. Again, your job is not to seek doubt. I'm going to use a couple of examples as I talk to you this afternoon to try to distill these legal principles down, because I know it can be a lot to have, have us talk about all this law to you all at once. Let's assume for a second that I had a much more pleasant job. And my job 
was to prove to you that the photograph that you see on the screen is a photograph of a $1 bill. And as you can see, there are various puzzle pieces on the screen. And those would be the evidence and the testimony that had been presented during the trial. Now, as you can see, there's a couple of puzzle pieces missing. And what would the defense attorney say to you? Ah, if there's a puzzle piece missing, then the state hasn't met its burden of proof. But that's not what the law says. The law says that if you take a step back, you look at that entire picture, and there is no other reasonable explanation as to what that is a photograph of, then the state has met its burden of proof. The same in this case. If you take a step back and you look at all of the evidence that's been presented to you and there's no other reasonable, there's no other reasonable explanation as to what occurred to Millie and Layla, then the state has met its burden of proof. Talk to you a little bit about direct and circumstantial evidence. You're going to hear the judge talk to you about that as well. So they'll do a little uh, defining. Direct evidence is things that you can see. So photographs, videos, documents. you got a lot of them to go through. Testimony from witnesses, because when a witness took the stand and raised their hand and swore to tell the truth, that is evidence that you consider. Now, there may be some conflicts in the evidence, and you may have to decide who is telling the truth. Like, do you believe Dr. Garrison or do you believe Dr. Sperry? But those are the things that you all can take into consideration. Testimony from the witnesses, what they saw, what they heard, what they felt, and more. So that's the direct evidence, kind of that tangible things that you can see and feel. So what is circumstantial evidence? And I'll tell you this, circumstantial evidence under, in the law has the same weight as direct evidence. There is no difference in the law as to circumstantial evidence. Sometimes you hear on TV, oh, that's just a circumstantial case. In the law, that means no difference. What is circumstantial evidence? So what you do is you take from that direct evidence, from those photographs or, or witness statements, and you can infer other facts that are reasonable and justified based upon your life experiences. See, again, that common sense thing coming in. There is no difference in the law, as I mentioned. I'll give you another example. Instead of being in the middle of July, when it's been nice and hot for the past three weeks, let's present, pretend that this trial actually took place in the middle of January. And we are getting one of those random snowstorms that we get every couple of years here in Atlanta. You leave jury selection. You leave the, the jury service for the day, and as you're driving home, you kind of look out of your window, and you see those kind of dark, ominous snow clouds that you know from your life experience. You know, hmm, those look like snow. You turn on the radio. And when you turn on the radio, you hear the newscaster saying, there's a 90% chance of snow tonight. But when you get home from listening to me and this young drone on and on all day, you are so tired that you have a glass of wine and you go to bed. When you wake up in the morning, you look out your window, and as far as the eye can see, all you see is white. You go downstairs, you open the door, you reach down, and you feel that cold white substance between your hands. You call your best friend who says, oh my gosh, did you see it coming down last night? It was absolutely beautiful. So what do we have? Well, we have the direct evidence, the things that you saw, those dark, ominous snow clouds. We have the um, white as far as you can see, and you can reach down and feel that cold white between your hands. You also have testimony. You have testimony of the newscaster that told you there's a 90% chance that it was going to snow. And you have the testimony of your friend who saw it come down. From all of those facts, that direct evidence, what can you infer? That it snowed last night. What's a defense attorney going to say? Did you see it? Because if you didn't see it, then you, then you can't prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. But again, that's not what the law says. The law says that if, unless you believe that some Hollywood movie company, for no good reason, decided to come in and spread snow as far as the eye could see to fool you in some way, that's not reasonable. But those are the types of things that they want you to believe in cases like this. You all are going to be in the position to judge the credibility of the witnesses who testified here in this courtroom. And you judge the credibility just like you would judge the credibility of any single person in your life. And I think we talked about that with some of you during jury selection. That's what you do when you judge the credibility of a witness. Do you believe that person when they got on the stand? Does it seem like they are credible? Does it seem like they maybe are being paid to say something versus someone who has dedicated their life to doing this type of work? I don't know, Dr. Sperry versus Dr. Darisol? 
Those are the types of things that you consider who you believe, who seems more credible to you. The judge is also going to tell you that the testimony of a single witness, if believed, is sufficient to establish a fact. If you believe a witness when they got on the stand, if you believe Millie when she got on the stand, and she had to sit in front of an entire courtroom, scared to death, having to look over nervously at the people that she used to live with that caused her fear. If you believed her, when you looked at her, that's sufficient to establish what she said. But of course, we didn't spend the past two and a half weeks just giving you Millie's statement. We gave you all the other evidence in the case. And I have up here the words cast director to remind me of one thing. I can only bring you evidence that we have. The only people, the only people who had a chance to decide what witnesses we'd be able to bring in are the defendants. They are the ones who decided not to abuse and beat their, those children in the middle of Lenox Mall, the middle of Target. They're the ones who decided what witnesses would be around. We can't bring you people we don't have. The judge is also going to tell you that the date, um, the date is not material. There's a lot of dates in the indictment. You're going to see that. You're going to hear it again. There's a lot of dates in the indictment. For a lot of legal reasons that I won't bore you with this afternoon, but there's a lot of dates in the indictment. But he's also going to tell you that the state is not restricted to the dates in the indictment. The date actually doesn't matter. What matters is the number of times that the child was abused. And I will tell you right now that some of the dates may not line up exactly with what Dr. Darasaw testified to. But legally speaking, that's, that may be an issue that on us when we drafted it. But it has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not we have proven that all of those individual counts, and we're going to go through all that. The, the judge is also going to tell you that the statute of limitations means when the prosecution started. He's going to read you a thing about um, whether or not this case uh, is within the statute of limitations. I can tell you it is, all right? Um, the this case was indicted in, you're going to see, 2017. That is within the statute of limitations for all of the charges that he's going to read to you. The number of counts, I said, there, there's some legal reasons as to why indictments are drafted the way they are. I'm not going to bore you, but I know Ms. Mull mentioned it at the beginning. There's 49 counts. There's legal reasons for that. Your job here today is to determine whether or not the state has proven each and every single count. You also have to consider the defendants separately. So they're not, they're not, you don't decide them together. You decide them as individuals. And you also decide each count individually for each defendant. Another way just to make our lives more complicated and your lives more complicated is in the law and means or. What do I mean by that? If you see in the indictment that we had charged something that there were multiple injuries in a single count, if we prove just one of those injuries, we have proven that particular count. I'll give you an example. Count two uh, is felony murder with the underlying facts of um, an aggravated assault being done to the abdomen, pancreas, liver, and mesentery. If we've proven even just one of those, we've proven that count. See, and means or. We have to make things more complicated. Probably why lawyers, they like to keep themselves in business, right? So let's talk now about the crimes charged. There's a lot of them, so it's going to take a little while to go through. I will, I've kind of grouped these um, by, the, by the way it made most sense in the indictment to try to make it a bit easier for all of you. The murder counts. You're going to hear several, several different types of murder counts. Jennifer Rosenbaum is charged with murder, malice murder, and she's also charged with several different, different types of felony murder. So count one is malice murder. Count two, felony murder with the underlying aggravated assault. Count three is felony murder. And there's an associated charge with that of cruelty to children in the first degree. I promise I'm going to make them, we're going to go through all these. Count six is felony murder, and the underlying count is uh, aggravated battery. And just so you all know, you will have a copy of the indictment in the, in the room with you. What is malice murder that Ms. Rosenbaum is charged with? It is unlawfully and with malice of forethought, either expressed or implied, cause of the death of another human being. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's talk about implied malice. Malice may be implied when there's no considerable, pro considerable provocation. And let's think about that for just a second. What considerable provocation could a two-year-old, how could they ever provoke an adult? 
How could they ever do something that would justify murdering them? Clearly, there's no considerable prov uh, provocation to justify murder. This isn't a situation where someone pulls out a knife, pulls out a gun, says, I'm going to kill you. She's two. And when all the circumstances of the killing show an abandoned and malignant heart, if you are causing blunt force trauma to a child's abdomen, that is the definition of an abandoned and malignant heart. So we've proven that she has unlawfully, and with that malice, with that implied malice, we have proven that she caused the death of Layla Dane. Because again, there is no provocation that a two-year-old could ever do to justify her murder. And when you stomp her, or punch her, or knee her, causing all that damage to her insides, how much more of an abandoned and malignant heart could a person have? Malice, to constitute murder, the homicide must have been committed with malice. Legal malice does not mean ill will or hatred. She didn't have to hate, uh, hate Layla. Is the unlawful intention to kill another person without justification, excuse, or mitigation. And what justification, excuse, or mitigation could there possibly be in this case? And here's the other thing, ladies and gentlemen. Malice can be formed in an instant. It's not something you have to wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to kill someone today. But when you decide you are going to punch someone or knee them or cause that kind of eternal injury to their body, you've committed legal malice constituting murder. The judge is also going to tell you that Georgia law does not require the state to prove motive. I've been doing child abuse cases for many years now, and I still can't understand why someone would abuse a child. I still can't understand why someone would beat a child to the point where they die. It doesn't make logical sense. Dr. Messner talked to you about some of the reasons why people abuse kids. Maybe they're stressed. They have unrealistic expectations as to what parenting is really going to look like. You, I don't know, adopt a two-year-old and a four-year-old who have been bounced around from home, to, from home to home in the past year. And maybe things aren't going exactly the way you want. Maybe being a third-year law student at Emory is a bit more stressful. Maybe things that all these things going on in your life have caused you to be stressed out to the point where you were taking it out on the children. Maybe this was discipline gone horribly wrong. Whatever it is, the state still doesn't have to prove the motive because I can't get into that mind. Felony murder. Jennifer Rosenbaum is charged with felony murder, and what does felony murder mean? That during the commission of a felony, um, so in a felony being aggravated assault, cruelty to children in the first degree, or aggravated battery, a person causes the death of another human being. And see, in this case, it doesn't even matter if we prove malice or not. If you are committing a felony, and someone dies as a result of it, you are guilty of felony murder. That says how straightforward this is. And under the law, aggravated assault, cruelty to children in the first degree, and aggravated battery are all felonies. What is aggravated assault? You assault another person with an object, which when used defensively against a person, is likely to or actually does result in serious bodily injury. And we don't know exactly what she used. The law doesn't require us to say exactly what it was, but clearly based upon the circumstances of the injuries that you see to both girls, Clearly, whatever they were using was able to cause was able to cause serious bodily injury. Hands, actually, under the law, can be can be those kind of deadly weapons. So when you see the knuckle marks on Layla's back, those hands were used in a way that committed an aggravated assault. Actual actual injury under the law does not need to be shown, but in this case. It has. Cruelty to children in the first degree. You maliciously cause a child under the age of 18 cruel and excessive physical and mental pain. Here's another example, though, where um, another example that you see in the indictment it says and, so physical and mental pain, and means or. Malice is not ill will or hatred. Malice means an actual intent to cause the particular harm produced. 
So did you mean when you maybe hit Millie with an object that caused those, those bruises on her side that went across her buttocks, onto her back, crossing multiple planes in a patterned way? Did you mean to do that? Yes, you did. Without justification or excuse. And again, what, the, what justification could you possibly have to do that to a two-year-old or a four-year-old? Malice is also the wanton and willful doing of an act with an awareness of a plain and strong likelihood that such a particular action may occur. If you punch a child in the stomach, that's such a, that's such a wanton act that you should know what's going to happen. You should know that something bad might come from that. Aggravated battery. Maliciously causes bodily harm to another by rendering a member of his or her body useless. Here's something that Useless does not mean permanently useless. So if for a while, let's say for an hour or two, it hurts and you can't use your arm that was broken, or you're not walking correctly, maybe you are, you're having pain back here from your rib fracture, those are under the law, those are examples of being useless. Does it affect the way that the body part is normally used? Again, malice is not ill will or hatred. It simply means the intent to cause the particular harm produced without justification or excuse. What justification or excuse could there be in this case? We'll now go through the felony murder counts that she's specifically charged with. She is charged with committing felony murder by inflicting blunt force trauma to the abdomen, to the small intestine, to the liver, and to the, um, and to the pancreas. And when we talk about small intestine, Dr. Uh, Derisaw talked to you about how the mesentery is a much more specific air, uh, definition of the part of the small intestine that was damaged. Count two, felony murder with an underlying aggravated assault, punching someone. So if you believe that she punched her or need her or did something in, something in some way to cause that internal bleeding and she died as a result of it, the state has met its burden of proof. Cruelty to children in the first degree. If she caused uh, pain, mental and physical pain, to that child, and as a result of that, Layla died, the state has met its burden of proof. Aggravated battery. If she caused a portion of her pancreas, which was split in half, or her liver, which was gushing blood, her mesentery, which was gushing blood, if she caused those body parts to be useless, and she died as a result of it, which she did, the state has met its burden of proof. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the charges in this indictment. And as far as how with Jennifer Rosenbaum, by committing those acts, she committed felony murder. How about Joseph Rosenbaum? He's charged with murder in the second degree. It's a slightly different charge. He's also charged with cruelty to children in the second degree. So what is murder in the second degree? Murder in the second degree means during the commission of cruelty to children in the second degree, someone dies. And here's another thing. We don't have to prove malice. I don't have to prove malice regarding Joseph Rosenbaum. Simply by committing cruelty to children in the second degree, if Layla died as a result of it, the state has met its burden of proof. So what is cruelty to children in the second degree? When such a person with criminal negligence, when the foster father knows what's going on in that household. Because what did Millie tell you? He would be there when Jennifer would hit them. One time he did hit them. But, but, but she also described he would be there when Jennifer hit them. One time he put icy hot. She just kind of described it as being cold and hot. And what did we see from the search warrant? Icy hot. He knew what was going on. It was negligent of him to leave those children in Jennifer's care. And as a result of that, Layla died. That is murder in the second degree. That is what we have proven during the course of this trial. He had an act or a failure to act. How much more of a failure to act could there be knowing that your wife is abusing these kids and you leave them in their care regardless? Party to a crime. We're going to talk a lot of, the, when we start going through the individual uh, counts, we're going to talk a lot about uh, specific acts um, and that Joseph is also charged with. So what does party to a crime mean? Party to a crime means a person is a party to a crime if that person directly commits the crime or 
intentionally helps in the commission of the crime, which could include covering up the evidence after the fact. So if you are putting clothes on the child to hide the injuries, perhaps, from those around you, if you are putting icy hot or you're tending to the injuries instead of getting care for that child, that's aiding and abetting in a criminal sense. That's party to a crime. That's why Joseph Rosenbaum is charged in these, in these indictments. That's what the law says he did. Knowledge on the part of the defendant that the crime was being committed and that he knowingly and willingly uh, helped or participated. Millie said he would do nothing, and, but he watched. Excuse me, Millie said he would watch and do nothing. She ba he bathed and dressed them. We had multiple witnesses say that. Even their last witness today told you that. In the weeks leading up to, their, to Layla's death, he was part of that. He saw them naked. We put on cream that, quote, smelled like old people and got hot and then cold. Aiding and concealing older injuries by clothing them. And the day of, what do we know he did? He helped Layla go to the bathroom. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Darisaw told you that not every single one of those injuries that was on Layla's body was acute. Meaning that some of the injuries were visible prior to him leaving. And in Jennifer's own statement, she said that Joseph ate and helped her use the restroom. That's what we're talking about. Let's start going through the, the other charges that are in this indictment. We talked about blunt force trauma to the head. Count 10 and count 11 um, are the blunt force trauma to the head. Um, and the date that's in the indictment is going to be November 17th of 2015. That is why Jennifer Rosenbaum is charged and she's the only one charged in these counts. What it says is that causing blunt force trauma to the head um, by assaulting them and cruelty to children in the first degree. And Dr. Darisaw told you that some of the injuries that happened that day were acute, meaning that they happened in a matter of hours. She can't give you an exact time. She can't tell you that it happened at 5.02, but she can tell you that some of those injuries on the head occurred that day before any of that microscopic evidence was available showing healing. Count 12 and 13 charge both Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum with aggravated assault, and cruelty to children in the first degree for injuries that occurred prior to that day. The date that's in the indictment, again, the state's not tied to that date, but the date that's listed in the indictment, just for, so you can reference it, is November 15th of 2015, causing blunt force trauma to Layla's head. The, Dr. Darisaw testified that some of the injuries on Layla's head, remember, she had them both outside and inside, some of those injuries were at least two days old. That's why they're charged this way as well. Count 14 and count 15, cruelty to children in the first degree. There's a date range for the, those charges, that, for those uh, injuries that occurred even older than that. Dr. Darisaw testified that many of, the, um, many of the injuries were in different stages of healing, including different ages of those internal injuries. And then you also heard from the family testifying about different times that they saw injuries to the face. We heard a lot of testimony about that. We even heard from neighbors who saw injury. Those are the two things. The date range that's listed in the indictment for your reference is October 20th to November 10th. But it's, we're talking about the older injuries. If you find evidence that there was older injuries, the state has met its burden of proof there as well. So let's, um, let's look at some of the injuries that we observed during the course of this trial. Ladies and gentlemen, those are lacerations. Despite what Dr. Sperry wants to say, everything we are seeing on the screen are lacerations. Nothing. That back there, I think Dr. Darisaw in all her years would know the difference between a nick and that large line that he wants you to believe was, her, was coming from shaving. Let's talk about the ear. That is injury, that is injury, an uh, abusive injury. It was either consistent with kind of a pulling like this, and we know from other injuries on the ears of both girls, then apparently they were either pulled or kind of hit in their ears quite a bit because there's evidence of other injury. But that's an injury. That's not infantigo. Dr. Darisaw would know the difference between that and infantigo. Dr. Messner, who was the head of the Child Abuse Pediatrics Program at Children's Healthcare Atlanta, would be able to tell the difference between that and infantigo. Again, we see the, the bruises on the top of the head. 
We see the bruises all over the head. They want you to think that Layla hurt herself all of these times in all of these different ways by bumping her head on the bunk bed. The defendant says in her interview, she did it once. Once. That came from her mouth. There's clearly more than one injury on that child's head. Clearly. And they're all over. What was she doing? Just banging her head against the wall? You see evidence of under the chin and on the neck area. And here we go. Remember when Tessa was talking about this photograph? And she said, I can see a, I can see a mark right there. That concerned me. What did Dr. Derisaw say? You can see it on the autopsy. And here's the thing. You might have to look at the original photo because there's, there's an even older one right about here. It doesn't come through quite as well when it gets projected up there. But if you go back and you look at this photo, it is clear that there's an older injury there that's almost completely healed. That's why I brought it up to Dr. Derisaw and had her look at it more closely. We see again injury to the back of the ear, injury to the underneath of the chin. And it's not kind of like right here where you, where you expect a child maybe to fall and bump their chin. It's more under. That's what was concerning to Dr. Derisaw. It was more under. That's the evidence that we brought to you, as well as the inside. Look at all the injury on the inside of her head. And I know it's not pleasant to have to look at these photos, but Layla deserves that we do. Let's talk about the back. We've spent a lot of time talking about the back. So what are the charges that are relating to the back? Aggravated assault. Dr. Derisaw testified that the bruising on the lower back was acute. Um, she only did one, one punch biopsy of the back. So the entire back area, she only took one punch biopsy. Um, but she told you that the, the, the bruising on the lower back was acute. And they asked her, could it be consistent with being punched? And she said, yeah, the child probably was being punched in her back. Count 18 and 19, that talks about some of the older bruising. She also talked about there was evidence of older bruising on the back. There was more advanced healing with early scab formation. These didn't occur at the same time. Because at the top of the back, she found early scab formation that was already starting. The date in the indictment for your reference is this, November 15th of 2015. And that's what we've been looking at. That's the injury. That immediately when the EMTs saw her, they were concerned. Who wouldn't be? You can see you can see that she probably was punched, or something of that. But you also see how they're in different, this is all the same part of the body, and clearly they're in different stages of healing. Talk about the buttocks. We'll talk about the butt in a second, but you can see the pattern that Dr. That Dr. Messner talked about. And Dr. Derisaw told you that, that those, the bruising on the buttocks was deep into the muscle. Again, this is the upper back and lower back. Evidence that you've seen during the course of this trial. Ladies and gentlemen, again, you're allowed to use your common sense. How come not a single medical professional who does this for a living, not a single medical professional has ever seen anything remotely like this? How come? Because she didn't get these injuries from the Heimlich maneuver. And she didn't get them from CPR. Blunt force trauma to, tra to her chest, abdomen, and hip. Counts 20 and 21 with aggravated assault and cruelty to children again. Dr. Derisaw um, examined some of these areas microscopically, and she sa said that the uh, injury at the left shoulder was acute because there were no neutrophil infil infiltrates present. Evidence of an older bruise on the left chest per the punch biopsy. Because in that case, there were no neutrophil infiltrates, so it was at least a few hours old. The injuries didn't occur at the same time. They're hours apart. Hours. Not minutes. Not a matter of five to ten minutes. They are hours apart. That's what the science showed. Dr. Sperry didn't dispute that. The science showed that they were hours apart. Ms. Rosenbaum's only saying that it happened in a matter of a few minutes. Dr. Derisaw examined many of the bruises and injuries. 
But she wasn't. She did not uh, biopsy every single bruise on that body. Again, the law doesn't require a microscopic examination. She actually went above and beyond, and her Dr. Sperry probably did five to seven times the amount of work that a normal, normal medical examiner would do. Because again, a child deserves that. Count 22 and count 23, cruelty to children. Uh, the healing liver laceration. Dr. Derisaw told you it's at least two days old. She can't, be, she can't give you uh, a further out date, but what she can tell you is that by 30 days, the research shows that it would be healed. And that 30 days is actually in reference to an adult. So in a child, it might even be quicker than that. But it definitely happened while they were at, while Layla was living with the Rosenbaums. Not like Dr. Sperry wants to say that it was so old. The research shows that the type of injury, laceration that she had, we went through and said, remember the OIS-1 and the OIS-2, and he didn't dispute any of that. The type of injury that she had, the research shows, would have been fully healed within about a month. But we know it was at least two days old. There's also the hypopigmented area that we've talked about. The date for the indictment is October 15th. So let's talk about the chest, abdomen, and hip. You can see the healing, you can see the bruising here. This is a review of everything that you've seen before. And again, here's underneath the arm. It's amazing that there's not a single bruise, though, over this area of the chest that she says she was beating on so far to try to give her CPR. Let's see. The hypopigmented area you see up here. Ms. McKee saw it a month before. Is she part of the conspiracy now? The other thing I found interesting about Dr. Sperry's testimony is when he was confronted with lie after lie after lie after lie that Jennifer gave regarding the, the leg, he was still like, oh, no, I mean, I, I'm still, I can still say that uh, this was an accident. But Ms. Moe gets up here and says, well, did you know that they were Facebook, for, that Ms. McKee was Facebook friends with one of the family members, which actually wasn't true. Was it, were you aware of that? And he was like, oh, no, I wasn't. But now that I know that, that would definitely cause me, I can't believe a word she says. That isn't that special. First of all, Ms. McKee wasn't Facebook friends. Ms. McKee, after hearing about it on the news, went and found a family member on Facebook and reached out to try to figure out who she needed to contact at the police department so she could go in and tell what she knew. She saw that area that was red a month before. Why on earth would she want to get involved in this? There's no external signs of punch or of kneeing or punching. Dr. Derisol and Dr. Sperry told you that you wouldn't necessarily see that. Because when you punch someone like this, the blood vessels actually have somewhere to go. Because you need the blood vessels to break before there's going to be a bruise. But if you punch someone or stomp someone or kick someone, the blood vessels themselves on the exterior may not show anything. But boy, on the inside, it was a different story. More evidence of the injury that were all over Layla's body. And they tried to say that maybe these were from fingernails? Come on. Use your common sense, ladies and gentlemen. What did Dr. Dr. Mesner tell us about what those injuries really look like? Blunt force trauma to the vaginal area. Dr. Derisaw testified that there, some of the bruising was acute. She also said that some of the um, bruising had lymphocytes present, so there was a bit of aging. What does that tell us? They didn't occur at the same time. Not a matter of minutes, like Ms. Rosenbaum wants us to think that all of these bruises happened. They didn't happen at the same time. This is what the medical science shows. So for these two counts, it's November 15th. Again, the state's not restricted to that particular date. You see the injury here. And here's one of the issues, right, with their story. Why, if it's the injury maybe is from uh, being pushed against the sink, why is this, in, why is this bruise vertical? Was she holding it against the sink like this? Bruises happen, the bruise pattern that you see happens by the object that it's in contact with. Look at all of the evidence here. Nothing supports what she says. The buttocks. Dr. Derisad testified that there was superficial, the skin, biopsies displayed mild subcutaneous hemorrhage. She said that was acute. That probably did happen within the first, within five hours. 
the date for the, the, the date just for reference was the 17th. On the 30th and the thir uh, counts 30 and 31, per Dr. Derisov, there was deep muscular hemorrhage with neutrophils present. So in the muscle of her buttocks, she had been hit so hard that there was bruising in the muscle of her buttocks that was at least a few hours old. That's what the science says. What are we talking about? We're talking about all this occurred because of resuscitative efforts. That's what the science showed. You can see on here the bruising that she sustained. Blunt force tra trauma to Layla's arm. There were seven bruises on the right arm and there were five on the left. You also had to look at some of the interior photos. The right upper arm had, uh, had a muscular bruise, the lateral right forearm, the left upper arm, the left forearm, all of these are inside bruises that she saw. What, we have to look at some of them. This is the evidence of the injury. Again, if you find even one of those you believe was from abuse, the state has proven those particular counts that we were just talking about. Look at that. You can see on the inside of her body the bleeding and the bruising. Fracturing her left arm. Cruelty to children in the first degree and aggravated battery. So here's where we get into the rendering useless. Ladies and gentlemen, you break your arm, you've rendered it useless. It's it hurts. Despite what Dr. Sperry wants to say that, oh no, she was probably running around and maybe hurt for a couple days and then she was running around. First of all, that's not supported by the science. And it's going to hurt anyone around the child. Let's assume what he says for, is correct for a second. For those first few days, anyone around that child is going to know that her arm hurt. She was crying. Why did all those doctors not, not find it? Because it didn't happen yet. The ulna fracture, the Dr. Derisol will tell you that it was at least 10, 10 days old. The other doctors told you that, and they can tell that from looking at the, at the x-rays. But it's not more than three to four weeks old per multiple doctors. Not just Dr. Derisol, but you heard from Dr. Duxbury, a pediatric orthopedic doctor. Pediatric. He sees these kids every day of his life in his practice. And Dr. Derisaw also told you that there was advanced healing and new bone was seen. That's what she saw in the, in the microscopic examination. It's not a non-union fracture like they want to try to say. What did the EMTs tell us? Immediately, when they were in the back trying to do life-saving methods, they picked up her arm to, to do stick her for some sort of medical treatment, and they noticed, what's wrong with her arm? What motive did they have to lie? Why would they want to come in here and purge themselves? What motive? The doctors and the nurses at the ER, they could tell that there was a deformity. And everyone in here can see it. There's a deformity there. This wasn't something that was that she was running around with for months and months and months, but they want you to think that because it looks real, real bad if she has yet another fracture that's unexplained. This photo, what did Dr. Sperry also tell you? Dr. Derisol was manipulating it. She was actually pulling it. That's why it's coming apart like that, to take a photograph of it. It wasn't running, she wasn't running around like that. There was healing that was going on, and you can see it in the x-ray. And I know that all of us, when we look at this, may not understand exactly what we're looking at. But that's why we have to rely upon the people who do this daily. And Dr. Duxbury and Dr. Mani, the, the radiologist who came in here, who literally looks at x-rays probably 12 hours a day, told you that that is a healing fracture. Dr. Mani may have used the word non-union simply because it hadn't fully healed yet, but he said definitively it was not, quote, a non-union fracture. He was definitive about that. That is a healing fracture, and you can see the signs of the healing kind of on the outside that I'm pointing to. That's what they look at, and you're going to see that callus formation. The arm was healing. It was about three to four weeks old. It happened in their care. Blood force trauma to her legs, the aggravated assault. Um, and the cruelty to children in the first degree. Again, multiple signs of trauma, both internal 
and external. That's what we're talking about in these counts. Let's look at this. How about this? Use your common sense. Does this look like an injury from holding a child up? Does that look like an injury from holding a child against a sink? No. She was abused. That's how these injuries occur. You also see other, other injuries on her leg. This is the back view of that. Again, your common sense, ladies and gentlemen, but you don't even have to just do that. You can also rely upon the experts who studied this and came in here and talked to you and gave you the tools necessary to look at all these things and say this was abuse. Fracturing her left leg. Again, cruelty to children in the first degree and aggravated battery. This occurred between 1017 and 1019 are the dates in the indictment. This was that proximal tibial fracture we heard a lot about from gymnastics. This fracture right here. Now, some of the doctors were concerned about the mechanism. Dr. Duxbury was concerned. What did Dr. Duxbury do? He called her back to Hudson Bridge and talked to Ms. Lowe and said, uh, weren't you concerned about this? He talked to Dr. Eanes and said, uh, weren't you concerned about this? And Dr. Eanes was like, well, now that you mention it, yeah. But she's actually with you, so if you need us to do anything, we'll do it. But you know, since she's with you, you can take care of it. So what does he do? He says, I need you to go to Children's Health Care of Atlanta at Eggleston, to the ER. I will call up there, and she said what? I will go. That's what he said. He memorialized that in a letter that he wrote that day. He's not coming in here four years later and saying something different. He wrote it that day. I'm concerned about the history, so I sent them to Children's Health Care of Atlanta at Eggleston, which, by the way, is located two doors down from Emory Law School. So it's not even like when they say, well, did you give her a piece of paper? She knew where it was. The doctors were concerned about it and wanted there to be a further workup. But what did she do? Oh, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I don't want those people at Eggleston questioning me. Remember what you told Ms. McKee? I hate doctors asking all those questions. He expressed concerns and she ignored him. That is the evidence of, that is evidence of abuse. That's how you can look at this and say these, these were abusive injuries. She gave different stories to different people at different times depending on who you were. Notice she never told Peggy or Tessa or Miss White anything about falling at Peggy's house. Because it didn't happen. Peggy would be like, wait, they hadn't been here in weeks or months. Tessa would be like, I don't think they've been over there in a long time. So she left that part out. Convenient. Interesting that this one healed so quickly, yet they want you to think that other parts of her body are just, oh, the other parts of the body can't heal at all. The ulna, that can't heal. The liver, whoop, that can't heal at all. But this one, this one heals nice and quick. That's what we're talking about right here. That was the fracture. And the fact that she treated it this way is the evidence of abuse that we can prove that this was a child abuse. Fracturing her rib. Posterior rib fracture, all the doctors, including Sperry, testified that these are highly concerning for child abuse in children because they come from a squeezing. And not just like, ooh, I'm so happy to see you kind of squeezing, a squeezing like this, fracturing the child's ribs. That's what happened. But even Dr. Sperry said what? Oh, that's probably only three to four weeks old. Well, at least that one, he agrees with everyone else. Because everyone else who looked at this also said that it was three weeks, about three to four weeks old and in their care. There's the evidence of the fracture right there and the signs of healing. Now we'll talk about Millie. Cruelty to children in the first degree and aggravated battery. Her left arm, Dr. Duxbury testified it was just a few weeks old per the x-ray. They testified this would be very painful. It wouldn't be something that, um, oh, why, you know, uh, she probably broke it and no one even noticed. They all testified it to be extremely painful. But what didn't happen? Going to the doctor. That certainly didn't happen. Maybe after she went to Dr. Duxbury and he was on to her, she was like, mm, we're not going to do it. We're not going to go down that road again. Too many questions. Doctors and their questions. Failure to seek medical treatment is evidence of her guilt. And his too, since this is part, since the party to a crime. He aided. He didn't get her treatment. He kept the lie going. 
he kept the facade alive. You can see that it's a few weeks old because of the periosteal reaction right here on the side of the bone. That's how they can tell when they look at this photograph, this x-ray, as to how old it is. They're not just making stuff up. It's not just a guess. This is what the science is showing. Blood force from an head and neck. At, this is count 44 and 45. There's clear evidence of bruising. Clear evidence of bruising in a highly protected area. Dr. Messner told you that an accidental injury to the neck, the likelihood of that is less than 0.2%. That's pretty low. And then you also got it on your ear, and then you also have these pattern injuries on your side that go across multiple planes. The petechiae. The petechiae come, uh, come from a high impact velocity, like being slapped. Something like that, maybe the hand or some type of object. That's how you get the petechia. Experts acknowledge, including their expert, that this is highly suspicious for abuse. So let's look at it. You can see right here the petechia along her neck. There's a closer view of that. That is evidence that she was smacked or in some way had blood force trauma inflicted upon her neck. You can see the, the petechiae right here on the earlobe. You have to ask yourself, how in the world are you getting a bruise on your earlobe unless someone is pulling you or squeezing you like this or smacking you? That's what was going on. You see it on the back of her head. And what did Dr. Messner told you? That's probably more consistent with kind of being smacked and the ear gets pushed in like this. How could you ever do that to a child? Her butt and back and hip. Counts 46 and 47. There was clear evidence of bruising, pattern of bruising. This is not from a fall down a ladder. It is across multiple planes, and it has to be a bendable object. To reach those multiple planes, it has to be a bendable object that is actually going to bend across those planes, maybe like a belt. That's the type of injury, that's the type of mechanism to cause what we see on Millie's side and her back and her butt. Now they put up Jennifer's sister to say, oh, I saw her, her fall the day before. But what did, she, what, did, what did she also say? When she was shown the picture, she said, oh, no, the bruise didn't look like that. Ladies and gentlemen, you can see what Dr. Mesner was talking about, the areas of sparing. You can see there, there are kind of lines, and then there's areas that are not injured. Ask yourself, how could falling down a ladder cause that? Especially even when the witness said it didn't. How could it cause that across multiple planes? She would have had to fall, I guess, roll down multiple, multiple steps. That's what we're talking about. It doesn't make sense. Cruelty to children in the second degree. The last two counts. I promise I'm almost done. Count for, uh, with criminal negligence caused the child cruel and excessive physical and or mental pain by failure to seek necessary and adequate medical attention for the injuries that the child suffered. So if you were supposed to seek treatment for, I don't know, your foster child who maybe broke their bones and you didn't do that, that's cruelty to children in the second degree. And both of them are charged first for Layla in count 48 and then for Millie in count 49. For Layla, she had a right leg fracture, she had a left arm fracture that would be painful as well as older injuries. And in Millie, she had the left arm fracture that also would have been very painful. The Heimlich and the CPR defense. Why the Heimlich defense? Why'd she use it? No one's saying that Jen isn't smart. She's a third year law student at Emory. She knows the mechanism. She knows how she caused that injury. And what do they also say? That kind of delay is also indicative of child abuse. She knows how she caused the injury. Oh, God. Oh, God, she didn't look so good. What am I going to say? Oh, they all said she was eating, and ding, ding, ding. Now we're fine. Do you know what's also interesting? She tells everyone from the get-go, I don't know what I'm doing. 
from the 911 call to the EMTs to the, to the DFAS worker, she's telling everyone, I don't know what I'm doing. Could that be because she's laying down her defense? Sure, she took current law already. They also talk to you that the pancreas is an extremely protected area. Would require a direct blow. And what did all, Dr. Sperry even conceded that this kind of like pushing against the, the side, that's, that the, the force would be kind of spread out across the entire abdomen. It would cause a direct blow. That's what happened that transected her pancreas. And it's extremely unlikely that the Heimlich would have done that. In the one case study that we talked about, the one time in history that has been reported that the Heimlich maneuver has caused a transection of a pancreas, the child lived. The child had no other signs of injury. The child had no other signs of injury to their abdomen. So what did Layla have all over her abdomen? I showed you these to show you simply you can't even see the pancreas because it's so protected. You can see all pretty much all the other organs, but that's how protected the pancreas is. None of the bruises are in the area where the heart is located. Isn't that interesting? She may not have, known, uh, she may not have had child CPR, but I guarantee you she knew where the heart was, right? Dr. Darisaw did tell you that there was a small injury that could be consistent with, with CPR, but what did she also say? The amount of bleeding was so small, it probably happened when the child was at or extremely near death because there's very little blood. There's no blood pumping out from that. That, could, that right there could have actually been a small injury from CPR, but look, that's the heart itself, and that's the amount of blood that came out. <laughs> Dr. Sperry, I'll leave you just a couple more slides and then I'm gonna sit down. He is willing to say whatever someone will say, pay him to say. That was clear yesterday. It just was. He's no longer hired by the state, and when the defense tried to ask him that, he said, well, a few of my DA friends may ask me questions. He never said I get, they hire me. He said they may ask me questions. And also think about this. He said, well, I left the GBI, and he did. He left that same week. Don't you think the GBI might have had an interest in having him leave quietly? Maybe we don't want to have this get too, too public. Maybe we don't want to have the fact that you've been stealing from the taxpayers for years as you've gone and testified elsewhere, yet still charge your time to the GBI. Maybe we don't want that getting out. Maybe we don't want that to be bigger than it already is. Because, hey, it might affect some cases. His opinion ignores basic facts and science, and he has a history of doing that. Just think about some of the cases that we talked about where he, he even test said it. Yeah, you remember testifying in that doctor's, that doctor's hearing up in Ohio where the doctor said, sure, it's fine for a legally blind man to fly. Oh, well, no, the accident was caused by a heart attack. And he based that upon where the bodies were in the, in the airplane, even though he'd never had any training in that. That's what we're talking about here. That's what he's doing here, too. He based his opinion upon the word of Jennifer. And despite all the inconsistencies regarding the leg, he's still willing to base his decision on her word alone. That, in and of itself, in and of itself, speaks volumes. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, because in order to go along with Dr. Sperry's theory, you would have to also believe everything that Jennifer said. Don't forget about all the times she's lied, not just about the leg, but what about when she lied to all of you? What about when she lied about daycare and got caught in the lie? What about when she lied about working at Banana Republic on a certain day in question, and whoops, got caught in that lie too? But also that was interesting, he changed, his, he changed it from accident to undetermined. Again, none of these medical professionals, ladies and gentlemen, had ever seen anything like the injuries Layla had regarding resuscitation. No one. These are just all of the injuries all over their body. And you have to look at all of the injuries and look at them in a constellation. You can't look at all the injuries in a vacuum. All of these injuries all over their body and inside of their body, excuse me, inside of Layla's body. How unlikely, or excuse me, how unlucky, and I said this to Dr. Sparrow yesterday, how unlucky were these girls? Only one reported transect, transected pancreas from the Heimlich. Wow, that in and of itself is already unlucky. She's a medical miracle. 
But all, oops, she also had multiple organs injured too. She's also unlucky because she also has an extremely rare non-union fracture that, that occurs in less than 0.2% of children ages 0 to 6. And even less likely because she has none of the risk factors and it was in her own. Her liver, older liver laceration was not healing as quickly as medical literature would show. That's what Dr. Sperry wanted you to believe. Right? Gosh, she, she's really unlucky in that way too. Her liver doesn't even heal right. The neck injuries, she's real unlucky, she must be real unlucky there too. And Millie too. Neck injuries less than 0.2% from accident. Ear injuries are extremely rare. Layla receives injuries that no one has ever seen just from resuscitative methods. And both girls have highly unlikely injuries indicative of child abuse. You have to think that these are the most unlucky girls in the world. And in one regard, you're right. They were unlucky that they were placed with the Rosenbaum. They were unlucky they ever came into contact with them. What happened to Layla in the final minutes of her life? It was a blunt impact force trauma to her abdomen. More than once, given the microscopic findings, given the microscopic findings that Dr. Derrickson testified to, there was more than one blunt impact force to her abdomen. She had massive bleeding internally. She had bruises all over her body that were inconsistent with the history. And that bleeding caused shock. That's what Jennifer was talking about. That's what she was describing. The shock of that child dying in front of her. The seizures, those death seizures that Dr. Darisol talked to you about, which Jennifer probably did observe. She died a painful and a slow death. And think about this. The last person she saw was the person who killed her. I'm going to sit down for right now. Ms. Moll will have an opportunity to speak to you, and then Ms. Young will give the final statements on behalf of the state. Thank you.